Hello everyone, welcome to the Crow Canyon Software webinar on Nitro Chatbots and AI Services, part of our Nitro Studio series of webinars we're having this month. This one is on chatbots and AI artificial intelligence services. Before we get going, let me explain a few things about the webinar. You're probably all familiar with this, but just in case, uh, there is a question box in your console where you can enter in a question if you have it. And we'll try to get to get to it during this webinar. If not, we'll be able to answer afterwards and be able to uh, you know, address that question directly through email. OK, this webinar will be focused a lot on uh, some slides and some, uh, I guess you could call it theory or, or techniques of chatbots. And we'll get into some demos as we go along. I am Scott Restivo, President and CEO of Crow Canyon Software. Crow Canyon Software has been in business for 20 years. This is our 20 year coming up right now. Then uh, 2019 will be our 20th year. And we have been doing applications inside of the Microsoft technologies for that time. And for the last 12 or more years, we've been working in the SharePoint and Office 365 space. So now we, we have the three kind of areas we work on. One is the business applications where we have out-of-the-box solutions. We have the Nitro Studio, which is an application creation platform. We're going to the AI and bots part of that in this webinar. And we also have custom solutions in SharePoint and Office 365 that we can do uh, tailored to your particular requirements. So in the business applications world, we have the kind of core business applications, core functionality that improve business processes. If you want to get off older, legacy programs and use SharePoint and Office 365 in this way, then this is the things they can do, such as IT help desk, uh, customer support, asset management, equipment track it, and those kind of things, security access, onboarding in the HR world. So there's a number of those. We won't go into those in this webinar. There are other webinars we've done on it and a lot of information online. We'll be focused on Nitro Studio. Now, Nitro Studio is an application creation platform for SharePoint and Office 365. We have forms, workflows, reporting, portal, uh, we're into the modern UI and the AI services, and we'll go into this part of it today. We'll have uh, another. We ha well, we had a previous webinar last week on creating solutions on SharePoint using Nitro Forms and workflows about how you can replace Lotus Notes, Info Path, and those kind of things with modern form solutions using Nitro. This one will focus on chatbots and AI. And the week after Thanksgiving on the 29th. We'll have uh, one on portals in the modern UI with it. Of course, there's a lot of information already online about about the uh, about the webinar. I mean, about Nitro Studio at Nitro Studio. Uh, is that on here? No, it should be, but it should be www.nitro Studio. You can also get to it from CrowCanyon.com. There's a link to the Nitro Studio. Nitro Studio is a component of the Crow Canyon software offerings. So. So let's jump into this webinar now that we have a number of people have joined and see what we can say about chatbots and AI services inside of uh, the Nitro Studio, inside of SharePoint and Office 365. So we'll focus on three areas, basically chatbots, natural language processing, and AI services. It's a very interesting world. Uh, I find it fascinating, and it's a very, very interesting. So let's meet, let me take you through some slides some information, hopefully, I don't know, hopefully this will be useful and interesting, possibly even entertaining, and we'll go from there into some demos and then show you what what this is all about. But most important, and I'll, I'll say this probably several times during this webinar, is, you know, let's talk if you have interest in this or needs in this or see some possibilities, we'll talk and go, we can talk one-on-one -on -one or do demos or do, you know, have meetings about how to implement these kind of things in your environment uh, and with a webinar like this I'm talking and it isn't interactive like when I give a talk at a SharePoint show or something it's very much more interactive with the audience and the webinar I'm just kind of flying blind in a way so hopefully this will be interesting and useful and productive for your your time you're spending with us today on this so here we go to what is a chatbot the first thing we want to do if we consider chatbots and AI services, what is a chatbot? Well, it's very interesting to look this up and research it because there's a lot of different definitions uh, uh, what it is and how people are defining what a chatbot is. It, some people call it conversational software, conversational UI, conversational AI. A virtual assistant is somehow 
coming into play as maybe a little bit higher end chatbot because now the idea of an assistant is helping you with all your your tasks or something like that. Or another word is interactive agent. Basically, it's an automated system of communication with users. So chatbot has kind of these different meanings. I mean, kind of know what it is, but um, you know, defining it exactly is probably a little bit uh, difficult. But some people say a computer program designed to simulate conversation with human users, especially over the internet. Uh, Yes, simulate conversation with human users. You know, there's a lot there, and um, we'll go into. It. But we'll see. My concern here, uh, as a business owner, a business person, is not so much exact definition, but how is it useful and functional for your organization to help you run things more efficiently? Uh, whatever we call it, does it work? Is it going to be providing the value that's needed? So why are chatbots so uh, hot these days? So much in the news, so much uh, popular. Well, first of all. We got this idea of 24 by 7 service. You know, if you want to do customer support and you rely on live people, either you're going to staff somebody 24 by 7, or you're going to uh, have off hours or you know have, uh, services over overseas or something to manage that. Well, chatbots being automated will run 24 by 7. They're highly scalable. You don't have to you know do a hiring process, hire and train people. They they come. Uh, you can multiply once you get the chatbot kind of down pat. You can do it multiple. Uh, expand it easily. They don't take sick or vacation days, obviously. The cost is relatively low according to the value gained. In fact, it's it's quite low compared to uh, using uh, live people in, in the chat and that. And there's, a two, there's two elements to the cost that I want to bring in here. One is if someone asks a question, that person, you know, through a normal form, that person is engaged in uh, you know his or her time waiting for an answer, and the staff has to be engaged on his or, on their time in order to provide an answer. So we're saving costs not only for your organization but also for the customer or user in terms of time and effort it takes to get a response and continue on whatever they're doing for their work. And they the chatbots improve with training. So the promise of chatbots is quite high. Uh, employees will benefit. It will, this is the promise. I say promise, you know, the actualization is always how it's implemented, but the promise is there, and I think it will get there. It is getting there, and in time, it certainly will. But it relieves them of mind-numbing, repetitive work. Um, it, they, they will have to, um, they can work smarter, faster, more efficiently with help of these uh, chatbots or digital coworkers. What this means is that, if, say you have a chatbot that's augmenting your staff. So if somebody calls in a customer or user with a problem, you could use a chatbot internally in the staff to say, go look it up. The chatbot would go look it up for them and provide them an answer in real time. Uh, so that's a way, one way to make the staff more efficient and work better and be able to provide answers. So, you know, it's like an internal bot. That's one example of what they're talking about here. And uh, chatbots freedom to focus their energy on work that requires thought, creativity, and ingenuity, and gets rid of the mundane uh, tasks that are there. But it, are they a threat to our jobs? Now, hold on a second. I won't go too deep into the whole philosophy and debate about chatbots and bots and robots and AI and all that. Elon Musk versus Mark Zuckerberg, all that. I'm just talking here, uh, brushing the surface of this, just to give a you know, note, note that it's there and it's something to consider as we go into this. And it will come up sometimes in your conversations with management or employee, employees and such not. But basically what it means is, no, there is no threat. It's more like the people will have to adjust. This is as we adjust to all technology that comes into place. I used to have typewriters, you know, if you remember way back when, I mean, I go into all the older technology. So every technology brings some kind of adjustment, every innovation. So people have to adjust. Hopefully, you know, the, the uh, will be relieved, the human workers will be relieved of repetitive tasks, but they'll have to advance more in the emotional, creative, and cognitive skills. And one point that I thought was really interesting, I found uh, this idea of activities versus occupations. So let me look, go into that. That bots can take over more routine, acti routine activities of the job without taking over the whole application. So here's an example I got from a McKinsey report. And what it's talking about here is what they did is they looked at all these different occupations, many, 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 800 of them or more. And they found that each occupation could be broken down into activities. And activities of, say, a retail sales, salesperson can be broken down into the capability. So the idea of this is they're going into where can chatbots automate, uh, auto, bring automation into play here, and where are humans important in this, and you know, balancing the occupation out differently. So the chatbots or the bots are not taking over occupations, they're taking over activities within an occupation. An occupation will have to adjust accordingly. And in fact, the occupation may even get better from a human scale because they're not doing the more repetitive, 
my, what they call mind-numbing tasks in there. So this is an interesting idea of breaking down jobs and occupations into activities and breaking the activities and what can be taken over by, uh, you know, done better, more efficiently, or relieve the humans uh, by going into the, the bot world. Quite interesting, and there's a whole world on it. And I, I, I have the slide deck available in this video if you really want to delve into these subjects. Um, I provided the links as best I could on this, so you can, you know, if you want to take the time to really research, it's quite fascinating to me, quite interesting, and and really, uh, really a big change coming to the workplace because of this. And here's one, uh, Maria, Mar Maria Yao, uh, here talking about the wave of the future. A conversational UI, we call it chatbots, conversational UI, whatever, ubiquitous in everyday life. You know, everybody, I don't know how many people have Alexa and that kind of thing, but that's, you know, there it goes, right? And so only it's only going to increase as we become more used to talking to our phones, intelligent speakers. But what really grabbed me about this quote was that eventually we expect all graphical user interfaces to be replaced or augmented by conversational agents. That's a huge change. That's That's big. And that's something that... You, we as business people and uh, you who manage organizations, you know, we have to get ahead of that and stay on top of it. There's always a lag in implementing technology, of course, but if you know what's coming or what's, what's you know, coming down the line, especially as people who are used to smartphones or get used to having Alexa uh, or other such devices, will be expecting this in the workplace also uh, to come into place, especially on the, on the phones, you know, with the millennials and their phones and all that. So the graphical, all graphical interfaces, interfaces to be placed or augmented by conversational agents. Quite, quite an interesting uh, and bold statement to make, but there she is. And, and um, if you want to read more about it, again, the URL is down here. So let's get into the chatbots and AI services. My thesis here in this webinar is that the technology is interesting, fascinating as sort of a geek type person. Yes, it is very, very interesting to me. But really, as the business side, of the equation is that it really has to, it really can produce results that are that uh, are improving time, efficiency, lowering costs, automation. So let's look at some of that here and focus more on that. Then we'll get into the technologies that Microsoft has provided to implement this kind of chatbot and AI services in SharePoint and Office 365. So workplace automation. If you look on the internet, you can see all. I just took out a few of these quotes. You're going to see this all over the place. Seven tenths of requests can be automated. Chatbots can reduce costs by 30%, answer up to 80% of routine questions. And I could have found a dozen or more more such examples of touting the glories of chatbots and how they can automate. And, and like any technology, there's a certain amount of hype, of course. But, uh, and there is truth to this. There is some truth that if you run a help desk or a service desk or an HR uh, system or uh, customer support, you probably well know that many of the questions that come in are routine and if they can be automated, well, wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be a way to go to relieve your, your staff of that well, mind-numbing, perhaps, or at least routine tasks, right? So here we go saying that, uh, this is again from McKinsey report, 45% of work activities could be automated already using, and if natural language is, is upped a little bit in performance towards human levels, 13% more. So you have to like over 58% of work activities that's what, you know, the occupations, the activities, well, 58% of the activities of, of various occupations can be automated. It's huge, huge. And here's where the numbers come into play, 2 trillion, you know, 2 trillion in annual, oops, sorry, i to go back, going the wrong way here, 2 trillion in annual wages. So here's where the money comes into play. You know, like it or not, I guess, whatever the attitude toward chatbots and AI is, the numbers are amazingly compelling to move in this direction. And the technology is getting so much better uh, to provide the services that that it's even more compelling. The cost will go down just like, you know, the uh, Moore's law about chips and, and all that, that the, the you know, as, as technology goes on, it gets better and cheaper, more more effective. So, so let's go look at how this is done. How is this done? And we're going to examine now that we kind of establish the, the basis that chatbots are well worth doing, that they can provide benefits, that this is the wave of the future, et cetera, et cetera. How is Microsoft taken and what's their approach and what's being done and how can we implement this in SharePoint and Office 365? Okay, so let's take a look. Azure Bot Service is basically what Microsoft provides. There's various elements to this. 
the bot framework, the bot builders SDKs, Azure Cognitive Services, which includes vision, speech, language, knowledge, and search, Lewis, which is short for language understanding, and the Q&A maker. And they're coming up with new things all the time, so it makes it kind of uh, uh, interesting to keep an eye on these things, and there's a lot going on. It's a very active world of, uh, of development and, and new, new things coming out, and we'll look at some of that right now. So let's go here and look at kind of a structure of a typical or, or I don't know, generic kind of bot. So you have your user interfaces through voice devices or web apps. Then it goes into what we could call the bot framework area over here. And then it accesses the Azure Cognitive Services. So kind of breaking down the bot into three, I mean, there's many other ways to do this. This is just a simplification, so bear with me. But basically there's a UI it's going to be surfaced or exposed the bot in some kind of element that engages with the user or customer, of course. That could be a smartphone. It could be many, many uh, different things, that different places it could surface. There's a bot framework, a bot builder that handles the request and manages kind of the, the gatekeeper or the, the processing of it. And then it'll go out and access various Azure cognitive services in order to bring back information that's relevant to whatever the customer or user is asking about. So I talked about the UI element. Let's look at that. The UI can be uh, exposed in a website or all these other different tools. So it isn't like there's a bot interface that only works one way. There's many places where that bot UI can be surfaced into uh, exposed to the user, and the user can engage it within these different things, Teams even, uh, of course, in SharePoint through a website. Ours works through the SharePoint interface, for example. And then it goes back to this idea that, okay, we had the you know interface here, we have the bot framework here, which is uh, the bot builder, the bot framework, and then we go out to the Azure Cognitive Services as part of the bot, bot's functionality is to go out there. The bot by itself, you know, it's more like a, uh, I don't know, dispatcher or a gatekeeper, you might say, something that's providing a UI, taking it in, and saying, okay, what do I do with it, and it has to go out here and get some cognitive services, and cognitive services really means more of the AI element of things right here. And so this is where it gets more than just simply, you know, call and response. It gets into bringing in some intelligence in here. So cognitive services is using AI to solve business problems. Um, there is a website. I had it in the previous one with the URL. You can explore this, but they go into vision, knowledge, language, speech, and search. Quite, quite interesting uh, amount of things they're doing in their labs up there. And it looks like they're having some fun. So uh, let me show you something that is here. You can try this, captionbot.ai. Okay, let's try it. I'll bring it over here right now. Captionbot.ai is something from Microsoft that uses vision analysis and Azure Cognitive Services in order to understand the content of a photo. Well, I, I'm going to upload a photo here from my own uh, here. You know, this obviously they've never seen this before, so let's just do this one. And it's gonna tell me a caption. I think it's a sculpture of a man. Not bad. I mean, you know, you know sort of a sculpture. It's got the sculpture part, I guess man part. But it's not that, I mean, I, I think with the right training and the right uh, cognitive, you know, a more aggressive, uh, more deep, it might even pick, her out, pick out that it's a Buddha. Well, let's try something else since we're, you know, having fun with it. I'll try another and upload a photo. And uh, here's another one. So I thought it would be interesting to try. Okay. <coughs> well, there you go. Small bird perched on a tree branch. Now, would I, if Azure Cognitive Services had more to it, like the data set was deeper, or it was more uh, restricted to a particular domain of bird watching, it would tell me that it's not just a small bird, it's a male cer cerulean warbler, uh, which is a type of bird that neotropical migrant that comes over, nests in the, in the uh, northern woods and uh, winters down in Central America. But anyways, it's a, it's a male cerulean warbler. So with the right domain, you could actually get uh, very more accurate, not just small bird, but cerulean warbler, uh, male cerulean warbler. Well, okay, that's good. You might be saying, hey, Scott, that's interesting. That's fun. But what the, hell, what the heck does it have to do with chatbots? Well, here's the thing. If the vision is being used in interpreting images, well, why not interpret equipment or assets? You have a smartphone, and the vision would 
the vision, you know, element of, of cognitive services would look at the uh, uh, asset or the equipment and be able to tell you that it's a, uh, I don't know, HP laser jet such and such and such and such, or, or it could even compare two images and say, hey, this is supposed to look like this and it looks like that, so maybe there's a problem going on here, right? So there's, uh, okay, there is, uh, you know, quite a usefulness of the vision, the vision capabilities of being able to interpret it. The thing is, it's it's using AI to do that by it's going pixel by pixel by pixel to identify that. You know, it isn't like it has a catalog of birds and it's doing a comparison. You know, like you might do with fingerprints, compare all the fingerprints. It's doing a pixel by pixel comparison there and through AI interpreting that as a bird. It's quite interesting. So I see that being applied to assets, equipment, and other such capabilities using a smartphone in that. Another one is natural language processing. We talked about vision. Now this is language and speech, of course, a very important part of any kind of interaction with, between humans and bots. And then some people call it natural language understanding. There's also an element called natural language generation, where it will, the bot itself will generate language based on some a little more advanced than simply taking in language and um, interpreting it. So this is Lewis, uh, L-U is language understanding. I don't know what the IS stands for, but somehow they call it Lewis, Lewis.ai. This again, a Microsoft site, even though it's got the AI extension, but it's a Microsoft site. You go there and play around with it if you want. In fact, we have that right here language understanding and you know if you want to have some fun with these things they do have some kind of things you can play with on the internet here you can turn on the light turn the red light on and it's going to show you the uh, turn the turn the right light on okay that one's on turn the floor lamp to green okay it's green and it's showing you all the stuff that goes on here to make that happen programmatically it's understand the language interesting huh so that's fun you can have with that but in, in the real world of you, how do you use this is another question. So uh, what we use that for, NLP, is, uh, oh, well, let me show you this first. Yeah, this is just another kind of example how you you type in something, and it gives you this stuff back, you know, the, the stuff that uh, you, you intake, your, your uh, program intakes, and then turns it into uh, some useful information. So let me show you an example using our knowledge base, how we implemented NLP in our knowledge base. This is one without, this is without NLP, just your standard, your standard thing, you know. Um, printer has a paper jam. And it's gonna come back with nothing matches. Even though, let me just copy that. I'm going to paste it into another knowledge base that does have NLP. But let me go back to this one and show you that there is actually an article in this KB uh, that come on, going here, that has a paper jam in it. So, uh, I mean, the article doesn't have a paper jam in it. I mean, the article is about paper jam. <laughs> the printer has the paper jam, not the article. So fixing a paper jam is right here, but I put that in and it didn't find it. But if I go to one, another knowledge base where we have implemented uh, NLP, and I say printer has a paper jam. Again, there is a paper jam article here. It's going to find it. In fact, I found two of them that maybe apply where the word paper. Because it's able to go up to Lewis or go up to the natural language processing and extract out the words. It's not doing a strict strict search on the exact terms you put in. It's doing it based on keywords that it identifies in here. In order to do this, we have to go out to the, uh, the AI service, the Lewis service, and say, hey, what is, it, what is this person actually saying? And the print the key ones. I, I I would imagine you could programmatically know this uh, if you did some decoding of this. But basically, uh, my guess is saying printer, paper, and jam. Uh, and it's 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 uh, bringing the article back there about uh, articles about paper jam but without having to type in the exact words printer, paper, jam, or whatever. So that's an interesting use of natural language uh, processing in list search in SharePoint. Well, this could be extended beyond knowledge base to really any kind of search. We have a search uh, screen and then you can go in and type, you know, do searches on for documents and things like that. We did it in terms of our knowledge base because our focus is then on help desk, service desk, and those kind of programs. So that's an implementation of natural language processing. And one of the services we provide is uh, this kind of knowledge base with NLP, 
natural language processing inside our help desk, but also we can extend that kind of search to uh, other search regimes, you could call it, such as document libraries and things like that. So that's kind of an interesting way and uh, more friendly to the users, much, much more friendly. And NLP can be used also in bots to do that. So uh, now I want to talk about something a little bit more about natural language processing. And that's say take the word exchange. And so exchange could mean a number of different things, you know. It could be, is it about stocks and bonds? Is it about email? You know, exchange server? Is it about exchanging a gift? You know, how do you know that? Well, the point here I'm making is that we have now have to get into this idea of domains. They have a context of the language. So here we have exchange. If you're in a financial asset management type application or firm, it's going to be possibly stock exchange or New York stock exchange or something. It's going to be if you're in IT department doing IT support, it might be about Microsoft exchange. If you're in retail and customer service, it might be about you know store exchanges of gifts or, or returned items and that kind of thing. So natural language processing has to function in the terms of what context you're, you're putting this uh, term in, and that gives it more meaning if you know the context than if you just say exchange. Well, exchange can mean a variety of things besides what I just listed here, and how do you uh, know which one we're talking about in order to do the, the correct search on that. So that's the idea of domain. And domain is that, this is interesting, and we should take this into consideration when deploying chatbots, whenever you do. Chatbots deployed for a narrow purpose serve, uh, prove most successful. So in other words, if you're doing a financial you know, firm and they use exchange, like supporting of customers at a, at a, at a trade, you know, trading group or whatever, a financial bank or something, then it's talking about stocks, bonds, and that kind of stuff. You know it's probably about stock exchange. If you're doing IT support, it's probably about the Microsoft exchange. If you're doing customer support for like Nordstrom's or something, it might be about a store exchange. So that's why I said in the said in the parameters and knowing what your domain of your bot is is very important. Again, there's some information here with a URL to dig into this uh, even more. So we looked at the Azure bot service in very very cursory method, just trying to go through some of the some of the things I have. I mean, I could go into a webinar a whole webinar just on this, and there are webinars on it, and there's. There's, uh, if you go to the SharePoint shows, there's whole uh, sessions on it, half-day sessions. I mean, there's an amazing amount of information here, and I, I find it really interesting and really fascinating and kind of fun uh, to work with here. But the, Microsoft has given us this framework, uh, the bot framework, the builder, the cognitive services, all these things to work with to build our, our bots and our uh, improve our service to the customer through NLP and things like that. So let's take a look at a chatbot more specifically now. A chatbot has to have a workflow. So if we go back to this diagram, we had we talked about the UI showing up in many different places. We talk a little bit about the Azure Cognitive Services that can be used, and now we'll look more into the workflow part of it. How does it actually function? So uh, just compare these two, you know, oops, I'm going the wrong way again. There we go. This is very simplified. Uh, expression of a bot service and this is more like how it is this is actually a fairly simple chatbot I uh, you know blurred out a lot of stuff but basically what it does is it follows a pattern of if the you if this if that if that or you know based on this result or this return do this so you're putting together these workflows that are um, the the di the basis the uh, the blueprint for the chatbot you want to build using those services that we just talked about so you have certain questions come up. As I mentioned, the domain of the chatbot. What are we doing? How, like they said, like that uh, infographic said earlier, keeping the domain to a certain uh, set amount of information is important so that you don't you know, cross domains and you don't know what the word exchange means. If you try and do too much, then you end up not um, getting the answers focused enough in your data set. It was too broad. There's too many different answers. Like, let's say paper jam. Just a kind of silly example. Are we talking about you know uh, jam that you make like jelly? You know, are we talking about paper jam? You know, like something's jam, traffic jam. I mean, it's, you know, things like that. So it's important to keep the domain uh, in mind and keep it to a certain limit so you have a degree of control over the answers that are returned. And who are the users? This can make a big difference too. Staff, employees, clients, customers. Like I said earlier, you can do a staff-focused chatbot that is only 
uh, geared towards answering questions. Somebody's on the phone, a CSR is on the phone, and a person says, you know, the customer calls in, but who knows what they're saying about what language they're using. Uh, hopefully it's polite, but I mean, I mean, in terms of what terms they're using and that kind of thing. And then how do you, uh, as a staff person, can interpret that and say, okay, I know my chatbot, I'm going to interpret that into this particular language that I can, you know, I know the chatbot will respond to better. So staff can be that way, a more focused kind of, a more, okay, this way. come back here. There we are. A more focused kind of uh, dialogue can go on between the staff and the chatbot employees, probably kind of similar. But when you get into clients and customers, they, you know, have a broad range of syntax they might use in terms of interpreting the, the customer. So you have to incorporate that possibly into your workflow and cons that as a consideration. Now, very important to the whole workflow is the data source. Of course, it has to match the domain and the users, you know, the, uh, to some degree. I mean, if your data source is not about IT support, you can't have a chatbot about IT support. You know, it's, it's got to be about what the uh, what the domain and the what you're trying to accomplish in the chatbot is. And there can also be external circumstances that add further context to the query of being taken place. You know, what's the user's location? Uh, even stuff that is a little bit more advanced is like, what about the weather or what about uh, some kind of uh, emergency or some kind of special situation that can affect the flow of the chatbot? That takes a little bit more to build in those kind of um, unforeseen circumstances that could affect how a chatbot should respond. So there's various types of chatbots, and if you really want to spend, you know, get a PhD in this, you can, I guess, because there's some, uh, when I looked online, there's about, I don't know, everybody's got a different opinion, and there's many different ways, different types of chatbots. I tried to get it down to just these a simpler a version I could present in this webinar. And basically, rule-based and retrieval-based seem to be the two ones that pop to the service the most. Rule-based is a little bit, um, uh, I don't know, I guess stricture, str uh, you know, there's strictures to it. It's kind of, you know, person types in this, you get that back. You type in that, it gets back. And it could be, you know, can only respond to input that matches existing rules. So it's kind of, kind of like a limitation to how far it can go, whereas retrieval uses heuristics to get resp best response from a database. Really, heuristics could be considered a fancy word for, you know, advanced search. So it does a search on keywords to return your responses, and it could implement simple or complex. Now, the thing is, with that, you can also, uh, okay, let me say this first. There's also generative methods, which use machine learning and training data, or the bot's given a whole bunch of conversational information. And it doesn't really need to know anything about the domain. It just knows that because when someone did A, B happened. So therefore, when A happened, I'm going to be trained that when the same thing happens, A equals B, or A plus B equals C. This kind of thing It's obviously much more complex than that. But the idea is that it's not really uh, retrieving anything from a database. It's not following rules. It's just saying, Based on what has gone on before in my training, I'm going to respond this way, uh, and, and that's a that's a method that takes um, you start getting into the AI world into that in, in that level. And then you go into your uh, ensemble methods, uh, like you're you're adding you're combining these different methods into one, and that's kind of what we do. We do rule based, retrieval based. We're not so much in generative methods because it takes an awful lot of training data and uh, some kind of uh, you know expertise in uh, that particular subject to get it to get it to get it going you know supervised learning reinforcement learning adversarial learning these are areas that will go in eventually but right now we're mostly focused on rule based and retrieval based and then there's a uh, really out there AI stuff like machine learning neural networks act you know all that stuff and if you really want to know more about it you can talk to you know see Maria Yao's uh, you know um, I guess blog or website or whatever at topbots.com here and, and go into the whole thing. So rather than get lost in all that chit chat, uh, all that you know um, uh, world of chatbot types of chatbots and how they work, quite fascinating to me. But in a webinar, I got to keep it focused uh, here on you know what's the value in the SharePoint and Office 365 world. So you can have retrieval and, or a rule base. So you have retrieval, and they can be combined. That's an ensemble method that we're talking about here. And we do that in our chatbot. Well, retrieval could be simply describe your problem. And then we use heuristics uh, search to go in and find out what is the best possible solution given the data set that's been supplied to us in order to uh, respond to that problem in the most appropriate way. That is uh, leaving it kind of open. Uh, this uses natural language processing. So if you typed in my printer has a pr paper jam or how do I fix the paper jam or whatever the problem is, it will uh, parse it out using NLP and then 
uh, use that uh, parsed out keywords in order to do the search uh, in the uh, in the uh, you know using Azure Cognitive Services to do the search and bring back results that could be appropriate to the response. I mean, and again, something has to be trained and take some time to get better and better, but. We'll go into that in a, in a minute when I talk about data sources. Another approach is rule-based. Well, rule-based rule -based means make your selection. Okay, I have a, well, if it was long enough list, there'd be printer problem here or whatever. If it's paper jam or it means email problem. So it's the guided, it's more guided to uh, exact answers. What I mean is that, you know, it's rule-based. If the person answers this, then do that. If person isn't really a search per se going on, but certainly a rule-based can branch into a search base. So, so not getting too lost in these uh, types of chatbots. Again, my goal, our goal at Crocan Software is to provide you with tools that will make your workplace more efficient and more automated and save time and money. And whatever this uh, complexities of this, let us worry about it. You can talk about it if you want, but uh, our goal is to make an effective tool for you. Uh, types of chatbots and workflows. Another one is menu-based kind of idea where you can say, okay, what do you want? You, is it a problem or issue? Let's branch off to the support bot. Is it a request? Let's go through the request bot. And these would have different workflows attached to them. Support, support bot is much more question and answer, much more Q&A. Uh, how do I fix my paper jam? How do I reload the toner? How do I do this, that, and the other thing? Now, I'm talking IT a lot, but this could be really focused on HR. It could be focused on purchasing. It could focus on equipment, facilities, anything like that at all. Uh, not just IT support. Any kind of question. Customer support is a big one. And then request bot could be I want new hardware. It's okay. Hardware is a what I call a I used to call forms-based process-driven, meaning that there's a very exact process that has to be followed in order to order a new laptop. It isn't a break fix where you come in, write in, I'm going to fix your, no, you know, fix the printer, you fix it, it's done. With 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 request bot, you're going through a prescribed process where it has to go to approval of the manager. Then in the request bot can show the person a catalog of, of laptops. Let's say they need a new laptop. Here's a catalog of laptops possibly with pictures that you can select from in order to guide you through the process of, of requesting a new laptop. And it might be that person's a sales executive, so the, the laptops that are shown to that person are a pre-selected list of maybe five different ones or two or three, whatever, that they can choose from. And then it goes into the manager and the manager would get a, you know, have to approve it or whatever the process is at the company to approve it. But it's not like you're saying, here's my problem. I want an answer. Okay, thank you for the answer. I'm done. The quest process goes through a different workflow. Therefore, it's uh, you branch off and go into these different, different kind of um, scenarios here as to what should take place and what kind of questions you should ask that person in order to uh, isolate the response and get the most appropriate action out of it. Okay, so now that all said, a very important part of workflow is the data set. You know, what data are you using, especially for the support and the Q&A type ones. The request uh, type bots, the data sources might be what laptops the person can order or, you know, that kind of thing. So there is a data source there, but it's really more appropriate in the terms of the uh, support bot. So support bot, you have like basically in talking in very general, ter very general terms, structured and unstructured data. Structured data is where there is a certain kind of meta structure to it, obviously, like knowledge base, FAQs, manuals. There might be an issue type, a category and issue type. It's some kind of categorization topic or whatever that can be used as a way to guide the search and but unstructured data is a little more difficult to uh, and, 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 and frankly there is a lot of unstructured data an awful lot out there how do you turn that into structured data or how do you access that in a, in a chatbot situation well that's where it gets real real interesting and uh, you know data analytics services and things like that can help move it from unstructured to structured at the same time, improving the structure of the structured data. Now, here's a infogra. Uh, something I pulled off Google. Frankly, I just typed in data analytics, and this is one of the images that came up. And I thought, oh, this is great. I'm going to put this onto this webinar, and here's why. It shows you that data analytics is this way complicated field. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't want to go into it in this webinar because it's something that could go into a webinar in itself. And I leave that up to the data scientists. God bless them for all their efforts to make sense of all the data out there. And it's a huge field, and it's great. And we're 
we're um, bringing on some data people to help uh, help our customers turn their, say they have a knowledge base of 10,000 tickets that they did over a period of two or three years. Whatever system, it could be our help desk, could be ServiceNow, could be any other, any other system. How do you turn that into structured data that can be used in a bot, right? If it's just sitting there as uh, 10,000 tickets that are like, have a lot, there's a lot of embedded information in there, no kidding, right? How do you pull it out? How do you distill it? How do you condense it into usable and make it, you know, using a probability statistics and predictive analytics and all this other stuff that's going on here that I'll leave for the data scientist um, to make it useful to, to your organization and uh, that not only that can be done with or without a chatbot. Actually, I mean, whether you're going to implement a chatbot or not, structuring your data, your your massive amounts of data that you have from your experience running a support desk or customer support into a usable set of information is certainly a, a valuable uh, activity, a valuable project to take on. And um, it was part of our AI services. We can help you with that. And bring it into you know if you want to expose that data source to a chatbot using a retrieval based uh, search, then uh, we can certainly put put that in in, in into place. And I keep saying SharePoint and Office 365, but it doesn't even have to be SharePoint and Office 365. It could be a website. You know, it's uh, we do SharePoint and Office 365 applications. So the natural bent for us was to put our chatbots and, and the AI services into the service desk, into the asset management program, into the uh, other other applications we have out there and make it part of our Nitro Studio. But certainly you can extend beyond that. So we kind of have, we have Nitro AI services, part of Nitro Studio. We have Crow Canyon AI services, which are broader than just the Nitro AI services, the same idea, bringing bots and NLP and other such things to the to the public, you know, to the organization, so they can use them and take leverage all the great tools that Microsoft has given us uh, with the uh, Azure Bot Service and the Cognitive Services, and um, bring those to to you know to the organizations who don't have the time or energy or expertise, or whatever, on staff to to make it happen. You know, it's quite a quite interesting. Okay, one other thing I'm talking about here before I get into the how much time I have. Well, I still got a few minutes, 20 minutes. All right, so the, I want to talk about ch chatbot telemetry. It sounds like I'm launching a rocket ship or something, but really what it means is gathering metrics, gather metrics to improve chatbot and performance. This is an important part of a, of a chatbot because what you're doing is you're getting responses. You're, you're looking at the activity of the chatbot in real time, or I mean historical and real time, and seeing what is being used, what is accessed, what is important, what is, what are people, you know, it's kind of like looking at web analytics. If you do have a website, you look at web, what pages are coming to, but it's different because we're focused just on the chatbot, but same kind of idea. How many people are using your chatbot? Are they getting the answers they need? What's the resolution drop off rate? What's the rate of transition to a ticket if you have that in your there or assisted chat? So the goal is continuous training and improvement, identifying areas where data set, KB articles, whatever, could be improved. Wow, that's great. That helps everybody all around. So in our program, we have that. And I'm going to jump over to that in our program right now and show you that in real time here in a chatbot we have going up on a on a on an Office 365 site. So here we are with a, a chatbot is running and it is giving you these statistics. You know, what interactions happen if you want a list of all of them, you can search through all the interactions what's the performance of the bot and these are by the way are our nitro reports for the modern ui this is a, a nitro component these reports just just i'll throw that in that is part of the nitro studio anyway so we built these uh reports using that and you can see there's all these different stats going on as to what's going on with the bot and most important out of all this is to go back here and say okay which ones have been not resolved and should i create a knowledge based article out of it or should i update the data what why was it not resolved so there's this iterative iterative approach using the telemetry coming from a chatbot in order to continuously you know drive a continuous cycle of improvement of that chatbot that's what i mean about training and getting better and better and better with it so uh that brings us to this sort of a summary slide I, you know, put together called an effective approach to chatbots in, in there. So one is the domain again, right? Another is to start small and grow over time. Define the workflows and be ready to refine them. Keep track of user response and, and chatbot metrics 
keep the data set up data set up to date as much as possible. Of course, if you're searching a database using the retrieval based search in chatbot, it's only as good as the data that's there. And that's one of the issues is that the data can get outdated. So we have this telemetry to improve bot and the data set continuously if people keep an eye on it to do that and see which and you know here's a user coming in they they uh, got through this much but then it didn't answer well maybe we need to do a kb article or some other uh adjustment to the data set in order to uh, make it better so that next time that question is answered it is asked i mean it is answered properly so this is the kind of thing to do uh, i think really important is the domain to start you know, small meaning, you know, with a pilot project, I guess, and grow it over time, get feedback from the users. I could, I could add that in, get feedback from the users. That's definitely important. Uh, make sure your workflows are, are structured and, you know, like that diagram I showed you, but also be ready to refine them. And uh, you want to keep track of user responses and the metrics and, and the telemetry, as I've been saying, and then use that to cycle back and drive a continuous cycle of improvement in the in the chatbot's functionality. So quite quite interesting, huh? There's a lot, there's so much to this. I could go on and on and uh, it's so much fun to talk about. Um, let me show you what we're doing with our AI services. This is a page we put up recently and then I'll get into the bot itself and give you some, uh, a little bit about, a little demonstration of that bot and what we can do there. So AI services from Crow Canyon, uh, we have the chatbots where there's AI based chatbots for Crow Canyon applications that are integrated into the applications such as Service Desk, we also can do custom chatbots. We can take natural language processing like that KB search I showed you, but also do custom NLP solutions. There's Q&A Maker, and I want to add on a section here called Data Analytics that we're going to add on here and help you turn your data from, you know, a whole bunch of, of mishmash whatnot into something that's useful and structured and, and provides real benefits to your organization. So now I'll bring over to the uh, bot itself. Hope people are still with me. I check in the user list. People are still here. Okay. Uh, see, that's the pretty bird, the cerulean warbler. Great, beautiful blue color. But let's look at the uh, bot here and see what's going on. So and this is a help desk service desk program, and there's a bot running. Again, this is just a demo, a generic bot. It can be done many different ways with different look to it. You know, whatever the bot framework allows us in the UI, it can be exposed in different environments. And the workflow can be structured just about any way you want, according to what I just told you, you know, just explain. Let's see if it still uh, has me logged in. Let me see what it says. Hi. And you can make the language as friendly as you want. And, you know, we, we you know, that kind of thing. So say, welcome. Okay, welcome. It could even say, hi, admin. Hi, admin. Please describe your problem. So please describe your problem. Uh, well, let's go with uh, paper jam. Paper jam. Let's see that. My printer has a paper jam. Sad face. No, I won't put that in. <laughs> I think you could, though. Probably good. My printer has a paper jam. So what are you doing? Okay. So we found the below articles matching your problem. Printer is not working. Fixing a paper jam. And if I wanted to, and what it would, what it's doing there is giving me options afterward. But here, I could say, oh, fixing a paper jam. That makes sense. Well, I take a look at that one. And it's going to go here and bring up the article about fixing a paper jam. You know, if you, of course, this is a means you have to have the data set there ready. You know, you have to have something there to answer that question, of course. But here it is for that particular uh, subject. And then you say, oh, okay, my issue is resolved. That's it. It's a lot easier than having a support ticket go to the help desk and having uh, somebody having to respond while the person's wait there trying to print and they can't print. All that thing. Now they still may call you and say, well, I don't know how to do this that, and the other. But, you know, we're at least taking steps in the right direction, aren't we, with this, you know, going towards providing self-service 24 by 7. You know, that's, that's a point. 24 by 7, middle of the night, the guy's trying to print something, get the paper jam. Well, he can find an answer through our friendly bot here, right? So then any person can come in here and the same issue is resolved or... You know, if that wasn't the answer, might enter more detail, try something else, submit a ticket, start over. All these things are definable within your bot framework as to how you want this to function. Um, oh, somebody had a question. I think James handled it. Okay. So uh, issues resolved. So you can go in different ways with this. So let's put in something that doesn't make any sense. Like, what is the weather in Florida? Sorry. 
just you know being a wise guy here, right? Who's going to type that in an IT support thing? But you never know. What's this thing? You have a nice day. <laughs> Why did it say that? I don't know. I don't know how it got to that point. Um, let me let me start over. Welcome. Describe your problem. Okay, what is the weather in Florida? The thing is, people like to work with chatbots sometimes just to kind of bust them a little, you know, like stuff like that. And it's going to probably say, I don't know. I don't know. Enter some more details. Okay, so it's kind of find solution based on, okay, let's say Tampa, Tampa weather. It's going to say, uh, you know, no idea what you're talking about. But I'm going to give you, uh, now switched over from retrieval to rules, right? And you come in here, and of course, this is a domain of IT support. So it's not going to have anything about weather or anything like that. But the point is that if you can't find a solution uh, through retrieval-based heuristics, it's going to come out and give you a list of categories and topics that have that can now follow more of a rule-based approach to the to, to the problem. So let's say it's a I don't know email problem or something like that. And then there's more specifics. Of course, these are defined in your data set in your knowledge base. You know, let's say it's a, a exchange server, not a, let's say can't send receive. Uh, it's going to try and give you some articles based on that. Can't connect. So if you kind of did a rule-based approach, this, this, okay, here's this. So then if you can't find anything else, it can go ahead and submit a ticket. Now we could have it start a live chat with a live person with, um, what do you call it? Um, well, we presence, I guess presence, the idea of if the live chat is active, start up a live chat. If it's not, then then don't, of course. So you can go, I want to submit a ticket. It creates a ticket uh, in our ticketing system. And now, you know, the uh, if a ticket's not preempted, the creation of the ticket is, I mean, the person's problem is not solved through the chatbot. It will go in here and create a ticket and then tell you uh, what <laughs> what you wrote in here. And that, of course, goes into our system, which has a lot of workflows in the Nitro. Nitro workflows, Nitro actions, all that kind of stuff. This is a Nitro form we're looking at, by the way, with the, in, a, in a SharePoint. And uh, what it does is then does whatever a ticket's supposed to do. An item is created, a ticket is created, it will go notify the staff and notify, auto reply back to the user and to all these things that you set up inside our system to do that. But now we're out of the chatbot and we're into the... Uh, into the service desk system. But you see that it created it with the right category and issue type description, the ridiculous thing about weather there. And then who it was with user information was pulled in from the Active Directory to create this ticket. So it really is makes a nice smooth way to go from chatbot into the ticketing system. Otherwise, the person will have to come in and create the ticket directly in the system and then wait for an answer and blah, blah, blah. You know, his her time's taken up waiting for the answer. Staff time taken up answering it. Uh, if it doesn't, if if it's uh, if it's if it's if it um, it's not answered by the by the chatbot. If it's, if it is answered by the chatbot, there's a lot more of that. A lot quicker response, call and response can be done. Also, if you're trying to track the issues and problems, like telemetry will tell you, you know, in your stats that you had this much interaction with customers, whether it's with the users also. So. Um, so from here, it can go various places. I think uh, this is a demo. I would do the uh, title a little differently, maybe call um, ticket, email, can't receive from ad, by admin account, yeah, whatever. But you can you can deal with particulars like that as you go and go from there. Now, I'm not going to get into the whole Nitro and how all these actions work and the fun you can have with that. So please stop me from doing that because uh, another hour-long webinar on that. We're focusing now on the bot. So back to the bot. And oh, we're almost at the top of the hour. Okay, what I'll do here is hopefully uh, kind of call call a little stop, put a stop in, and uh, hopefully people will be asking questions and want to engage with us uh, one on one and see if we can implement this kind of technology that I covered. Pretty comprehensive overview, I hope, and pretty useful. I hope it was uh, good for people to to get that kind of overview and see what we're doing with natural language processing, how we're leveraging the Azure bot service and the cognitive services, and how the uh, chatbot can function and the different kind of chatbots we can have, uh, the data analysis and the telemetry, uh, all that, you know, where we're putting together this, uh, you know, what this Nitro bot chatbots and AI services are all about. Uh, hopefully this was a good webinar for everyone and I'll have a recording of it available. I can send out. Um, we'll have, you know, if you want to explore more like those links and URLs that I put on there 
And I'm really interested in uh, any time talking to people. I want to send an email, ai at crowcanyon.com. Nice, simple email address to remember, ai at crowcanyon.com. It will come to me and to other members of our AI group, and we will uh, respond and have communication. This is all you know, new ground for all of us, mostly. And uh, whatever we can do to help you move in this direction, let's do that and work together on it. So thank you for attending this webinar, and I appreciate your you're taking the time out to explore this with us today. Now, let me see if there's any questions. Uh, okay, I think we're okay on the questions. Everybody, I hope you have a nice day. And uh, for those of you uh, celebrating Thanksgiving next week, I hope you have a good holiday uh, next week. Thank you.